you know, what's going on in the world needs to peel apart this sort of Fox News versus MSNBC. You know, each of them is a voice of their respective parties. They need to peel apart this sort of, okay, you're left wing, I'm not, and we can't have a conversation anymore. Uh, and realize that, you know, first of all, both parties have grown this uh, government and created the debt that we have. It's happened under Republicans as much as, if not more so, than, um, you know, than Democrats. And, uh, you know, it's not going to get better by just sort of saying, okay, let's elect the good guy. Yeah. I think things might get better if, if, uh, if, if Matt Kibbe or Ed Lopez were elected, but I have too much dirty laundry. I can't, I can't survive the, the process. Oh, I would be corrupted yeah. from day yeah. one. Yeah. I, yeah. I, oh, I would... and that's the point I was going to make. I yeah. mean, look at how, look at the left's reaction to when Obama got elected. I mean, the first thing he did was sort of drop a bunch of his, uh, like, what did he do on, what did he do on marijuana after he got elected? He, he ramped up enforcement. Yeah. What did he do on, you know, the, 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 the conflicts abroad? He prosecuted them even stronger than Bush did, I right? Think he, I think he dropped, I forget what the number is. Logan, do you remember? He dropped so many more bombs than, yeah. than Bush did. Yeah. But he, he got a Nobel Prize, so. Uh, yeah, well, like, you know, the, the good thing good. is they front-loaded that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but point is, like, once you. And he you also, know, like, yeah. very aggressive on deportation. Yeah. Of, of, that's, that's of illegal right. immigrants. That's right. And, and so it part of this part of this political mythology is incredibly frustrating because it's not fact based at all. And I think that part of the mythology is um, your party's bad, my party's good. Uh, I can't grant you a single point argumentatively. Otherwise, you're going to think that I buy into everything. Um, it's a left right thing. No, it's about power and incentives. Yeah. So th- let's let's talk about a classic public choice. Um, concept in in that because because parties exist in part to protect the two party cartel, but they also serve as sort of a, a proxy for for an ideology, right? And you know people will vote Republican because they think they're going to get X, or they'll vote Democrat because they think they're, they're going to vote Y. And you discuss this in your book. the 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 concept is the public choice concept is is rational ignorance. Mm-hmm. And and I like to point out there's a there's a phrase amongst conservatives that they, they say in a sort of a derogatory phrase low information voters right and I always go out of my way to say um, I live and breathe this stuff every day and I am a low information voter <laughs> I couldn't possibly know all of the the intertwined incentives and and who's showing up in which senator's office and what's buried in a bill that no one gets to read right. before they vote on it. So, so we live in a world of, of political radical ignorance, but, but that's sort of, uh, you know, the public choice explanation is it's rational not to know everything because you've got more important things to do with your life. Right. I mean, information is hard to get your hands on. Yeah. And let's suppose that you did spend a good chunk of your time um, looking up the records of every representative that you have all the way up the chain. What good is that going to do you? At some point, you can cast a vote. Um, if you spend enough additional time, sure, you can start writing letters. You can have your voice, um, you know, resonate louder than other voices do, but it's not going to be that much louder. It's not going to be that influential. Uh, and so, you know, the costs are high and the, and the gains are relatively low. And so what, what, what that ends up doing is it creates, um, some leeway among people who are making the decisions in the policy world. And, you know, a little while ago, I said they're they're going to be responsive to what voters want. Uh, And now I'm saying that there's leeway to be unresponsive to voters. Well, which one is it? And, you know, it's all contextual. It it can depend on what the issue is. It can depend on what the timing is. Uh, But, you know, I, I wrote my dissertation on term limits, congressional term limits. And it turns out that Congress voted on term limits, uh, whether to impose term limits on themselves. Right. It's kind of an interesting it was like a vote observation. In, was it was in 95, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. there was a vote in 95. Um, and then there was another vote in 97. Interestingly, there was a Supreme Court decision in between those two. And the voting, the, the Supreme Court ruled that individual states cannot impose term limits on their own members. And that radically changed how members of Congress voted on it compared in 97 compared to in 95. Uh, you know, so it, it, when, the, when the heat is on, is when they're most likely to be responsive to the voters. Mm-hmm. But, you know, how do you generate that heat? It tends to happen almost spontaneously 
it the the political winds blow where they where they will. Some of it can be engineered, uh, but also at the same time, just count the number of time of attempts to engineer that, and you'll be close to the number of failures uh, in attempting to engineer that. Oh, I know. I was a Tea Party organizer, right. and yeah, and we were going to balance the budget, and and we were treated perhaps worse than you are um, sometimes on your own campus for being crazy, crazy idea that we would balance the budget. And, and here we are, the, the, the debt and the deficit is, is unimaginably large. Neither um, of the two parties want to do that. Yeah. 